Yeah. Okay. So, um, that was a good introduction to dynamic conservation planning. Uh, we started that discussion yesterday with our uh, imaginary Cedarburg management exercise. And I want to take you back to the Cedarburg now to finish up on our dynamic conservation plan for this, the Cape region. And what's happened is that you've presented your findings about how you were planning to manage the Cedarburg for climate change to your superiors in Cape Town. And they were so pleased with your result that they've asked you to undertake the planning for the entire system. They thought that because your, your management plans for the Cedarburg were extending outside the reserve and included consideration of some of the other reserves in the region, that you should be called upon to do a plan for the entire region. So you've been promoted to the capital, you're now in your new office, and you have to figure out how you're going to do a management plan with no projector working. Uh, I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, hopefully it won't continue to go to sleep on us. But we don't need it a lot here in the early going. Um, so, the, your boss has said to you, we want you to do a conservation plan for our protected areas network for biodiversity to conserve all the proteas. And you have models of all the proteas, so we can look at that a little bit. Um, but So, as you start on that exercise, what's the first thing you're going to want to do to make a protected areas plan. And that means you may be able to propose extensions or expansions of the protected areas system. Um, what's the first thing you're going to want to do uh, to have in included in that reserve system that he's asked you to design for climate change? So you're, you've been asked to design a system that conserves all of the proteas. What's the What's the first goal that you're going to set out for that system that you're designing? This is going back to Mona's presentation about reserve selection. What are you going to want to have be true about the proteas if you're designing a reserve system for protea conservation? Sorry? I couldn't hear. Uh, mapping. mapping. You, you want to map the proteas. With, so what do you want to be true about the proteas when you map them? Sorry? Uh-huh, right. Yeah, exactly. So we want to go back to those principles of what was the first one you said? Representation? Yeah, right. Okay, so representation means really just getting one instance of every protea in a protected area. So that if you assume that we lose all of this white and gray area outside the protected areas, you want to be sure that at least one instance of every species is in a protected area so that all the proteas are represented in your protected area system, right? So maybe we should write that down. So representation. Oops, okay, ran out of space. So representation, first thing we want to think about. Then, if we had all of the species represented, say, once in the protected area system, is that enough for them to persist 20 or 30 years in the future, not worrying about climate change right now, but just thinking about how we might want to design a protected area system? Are we going to be, and we haven't said how big an area of each species we're conserving, uh, but let's assume that it's a square kilometer or something. Uh, if we get one square kilometer of every species somewhere represented in the protected area system, do you think that's going to be enough? So that's the second principle. We need multiple populations, and we need to have large enough populations that those populations will persist. And so that's where persistence came in. So that was the other principle 
So persistence is the other principle we wanted to look for. So we're going to design a system. We're going to make sure that every species is represented somewhere in that system. And in fact, we're going to make sure that every species is represented multiple times in the system because we think uh, it's important to have multiple populations so that plants have adequate uh, populations to survive stochastic changes and that those populations are maybe scattered around the reserve system a little bit so that if something catastrophic happens to one reserve, gets hit by a storm or destroyed by fire, that there are other populations in the reserve system to look at. Um, so then what sort of a tool might we want to use to do that sort of reserve system design? And again, these are just some tools that Mona talked to you about the other day. Um, do you remember some of the names of some of the tools that are available for doing uh, ResNet. ResNet? Yep. So ResNet is one. Anybody remember a different one? Mark San. Uh, anybody else <laughs> remember a different one? <laughs> We're running down the list. Zonation is another one we talked about a little bit. And then there are also actual op optimization programs. So ResNet, Mark San, um, world map. There's several of these conservation softwares, uh, but many of them are just ways of approximating an optimal solution to the problem. Um, well, it turns out that our boss was really happy with this, and so we're going to use an optimization program, which is a pretty expensive piece of software. costs five or ten thousand dollars, and you need some very t technically sophisticated people to implement it for you. Uh, but you've just been promoted to the capital and the University of Cape Town has some great mathematicians that know how to do optimization problems. So they're going to help you and, and they're going to set you up with a, a system for identifying uh, what the optimum solution is for representing all species in the, in the system and having them persist. And the persistence part is really just saying that we're going to set a target for each species greater than one occurrence and we're going to ask each species to meet its target as we use this optimization program to uh, decide where whether we have enough protected areas maybe we have all these species represented in the existing protected areas in which case our job is done but if they're not all represented and don't all meet their target in the existing protected areas then our job is not done and we have to identify additional areas that might be added to the system Okay, so far so good. So if we weren't, if our specific mandate wasn't climate change, then we'd be pretty well set. We, we have an a, a optimization program that we can use to design our protected area system, figure out whether we can uh, represent all our species and have them meet their persistence targets, um, and we're ready to go. But our mandate is to look at climate change so it gets a little bit more complicated. Not a lot, but a little bit. And this is where we go back to what we were looking at yesterday and asking where species move through time. So now, instead of just having to represent every species in the system and have it meet its persistence target, we need that to happen for every time step every 10-year time step from now until 2050, those sort of five time steps that we looked at last time and that are reflected here as the species goes through 10 years by 10 years. So if we want this species to be represented in reserves, uh, in every time step we're going to have to do something a little bit special with our reserve selection algorithm to make that happen. And what we're going to do is we're going to look for places where first the species stays in the same place in all five time steps, okay? So the easiest way to solve this, so think about our representation being the species is found in one of the existing reserves once. Our persistence is that the species is found in several different places that meets a target that's larger than just one of these grid cells. Um, but now we're going to ask it to meet that target through time. So if the species stays in one place, let's just imagine we have a single grid cell, a single raster cell, okay? And let's say the species is there now, we'll call that time zero. 
And then if the species stays there in every time step, time step one is 2010, time step two, 2020, time step three, four, and five, if it stays there in all five time steps, well then that's fine. It's that's essentially the same as it being represented in that grid cell in the present, and it stays in the same place. So we can see that happening, hopefully with this species somewhere. If we, you look up in these mountains somewhere, there are places where the species exists in the present, probably over here actually. The species exists in the present, and it exists in the future, and so it exists in each of the five time steps, and your, your job is done for that species because you only have to identify that one place for it. But the other thing that can happen, and let's take the other extreme, is that the species could be moving, and you might have to move grid cells each time step in order to track the species. And so if you, if you wanna do that, then you're gonna need all five time steps to be represented. So let's say these are just neighboring grid cells. So you're in the first grid cell in time zero, but then let's say the species range is shifting this direction. Well, then when it shifts in the first 10 year time step, you need it to be represented in the next cell over in the first time step, and then one cell over in the following time step. And as each time step goes along, you need it to be represented in that cell to create a chain, an entire chain of habitats that it progressively occupies, and we're assuming that it can move far enough in 10 years that it can reach the next door cell. And so we call, the, call that a chain of connectivity for the species as it moves with climate change. And you can see some of those in this, <coughs> this animation as well. If you look up here, uh, right about now in the present, once it cycles through, here's the species. It says it has suitable climate space here, and that space gradually moves across and you can't conserve that species only by saving that first grid cell because it actually moves out of that grid cell, but you can conserve that population by assuming that it's gonna be able to move to adjacent grid cells um, to, to capture it. So is that okay? Does everybody get that till now? Any questions? So we either wanna find places where the species is, is there now and will be there in, the, in 2050, or find a chain of habitat that connects where the species is now to where it would be in the future. Kind of like when we were looking within the cedar bird, you know, it starts in one, some of those species expanded in the cedar bird, um, in which case you can just conserve them in one place, but other species were moving outside of the reserve, in which case you might need to have a chain of habitat that starts in the reserve but goes outside of the reserve, okay? So we're looking for chain. So the, the main point here would be that the shortest possible chain is just one grid cell. So I'll, I'll call them chains, but it might be one grid cell if it's present in all five time slices in one place. Or it could be at most a chain of uh, five or six grid cells where the species is present in successive grid cells that are neighboring, okay? So those chains, um, exist for each one of these species, and there are a lot of those chains. So if you can imagine, each one of these species has hundreds or thousands of possible chains of, of connectivity where you start in one grid cell and you just try to have suitable habitat either there or next door in each time step, okay? And that's where the optimization program comes in, is it can look, and look at every chain for every species and then solve the same problem that we wanted it to solve before for representation and persistence, which means essentially we tell it how many chains we want to ha have represented, what our representation target is, and it's an area, right? So that area might be um, 100 square kilometers. And so we decide that we're going to set that target for every species, and then we need to find enough chains to satisfy that target. So each one of these little grid cells is about five hectares, or uh, uh, 500 hectares rather, and so we need about 30 of those to add up to our target. And so what we're doing is asking the reserve selection algorithm, or the optimization program, to identify enough chains for every species 
that every species is represented in protected areas. Well, what it turns out is that you can't do that because what this map shows is the light green areas, remember, are the existing protected areas, and the, but the dark green areas, which we didn't talk about last time, are the new <coughs> protected areas that you'd need to add to meet your representation and persistence targets for every species. And what the algorithm is doing is looking through all the chains for every species and then comparing each grid cell and choosing grid cells that let you represent all species to your target in the least amount of area, okay? So in order to capture species in the least amount of area, you just need to find chains that are going to work for that species and to work for other species. And then if they exist outside of existing protected areas, you may need to add that area to the protected area system to protect all the species as climate changes. Yeah, I do. Uh, I just a bit confused when I just take this one with the ground, uh -huh. especially in our case. Uh, for example, in our case,